Hello and welcome to EDU. I'm Eric DeReese. Today we're going to talk about the 10 generations of higher education and how they affect our society today. Hey, wait a minute, i got to stop the video for just a second here because um, I want to remind you to click the like button if you like this video. And while you're at it, why not click on the subscribe button so that when I make new videos you can get notifications about them. And uh, also at the end of the video, please leave your comments in the comments section. I'm really interested in your feedback, okay? All right, let's get back to the video. Colleges today embrace many things that they didn't when I first started as a freshman. In fact, many of these things didn't even exist back then. For example, there were no online classes or social media. Uh, even today, it's hard to believe that social media is actually embraced as a tool for teaching. But then again, when I look at the history of higher education, I realize that I shouldn't be surprised. Higher education in the United States has gone through a tremendous transformation since its origins in the mid-1600s. From schools whose only function was the training of ministers to the contemporary university of free and open access, both society and culture have had tremendous effects on the evolution of higher education in America. First, let's look at Generation 1. The first generation of higher education in America saw the development of colleges as adjuncts or outgrowths of their respective churches. The original three colleges of the colonies, Harvard, Yale, and William and Mary, all sought to educate their students as ministers. It was the belief that preparation for the ministry was predicated by a liberal education that included studies focused on classical languages and the three philosophies of ethics, metaphysics, and science. Next, Generation 2. The second generation of higher education in America saw a break from the purely religious institutions of the first generation to a more secular model of education. In addition, the teaching model moved from one of tutors to one of more competent instruction. Instead of primarily educating men for the clergy, as in the previous generation, the existing colleges also now sought to educate a growing class of gentlemen who pursued professional and merchant careers. Next is Generation 3. In this generation of higher education in America, several elements gained paramount importance, including the idea of a Republican education coupled with influences from the Enlightenment. At this time, the concept of combining education with the Republican ideals of selflessness, patriotism, and virtue took root. In addition, enlightenment learning included especially the truths afforded by science and reason became important facets of the collegiate education. Now, Generation 4. In the early 1800s, higher education in America uh, faced not only serious problems, but serious questions as well. The highly touted Republican education of the previous period was being replaced by an upsurge of religious spirit. In addition, serious questions were raised as to the curriculum, ownership, and mission of institutions of higher learning. In addition, the end of the period saw the introduction of the private denominational college. Now let's move on to Generation 5. According to Geiger, this generation saw great attempts at reform, but also introduced the robust model of the private denominational college as the characteristic institution of the United States. While some reform efforts were failures, the establishment of the denominational colleges as the institution characterized by higher education in America was successful. In addition, this period saw colleges evolve from a strict code of discipline to one in which students took a more active role in college life. In addition, state universities began to take root in the southern U.S. states. Now, let's move on to Generation 6. The years from 1850 through 1890 was a period that witnessed great expansions in many areas of higher education in America. Colleges based on a German-style education that offered graduate education began to take root. Other evidence supporting the theme of expansion includes the development of agricultural colleges and the inclusion of students other than white males. Let's move on to Generation 7. 
During the latter part of the 19th century and into the early 20th century, the salient themes surrounding higher education in America were standardization and growth. Not only were curriculum standardized, but organizational structures were standardized as well. Institutions of higher learning were now organized academically with administrative units to link those academic departments. In addition, the, this generation saw the development and proliferation of the collegiate ideal, which included not only academics, but athletics and extracurricular activities as well. The large increase in female students attending co-educational institutions supports the notion of growth as a vital factor of higher education in the seventh generation. Next, Generation 8. This generation introduced higher education in America to the masses instead of just those identified as elite. Students in the inner cities and those from modest means could now attend college alongside their wealthier counterparts. Geiger reports that the College of the City of New York was one of the fastest growing institutions that catered to the mass population. In addition, college was now within reach for most high school graduates, growing from 9 to 51 percent of age cohorts between 1910 and 1940. Next is Generation 9. The years of 1945 through 1975 were characterized by the standardization of academics and the growth of student bodies. According to Geiger, this period saw the greatest growth of students since the founding of higher education in America. The introduction of the Serviceman's Readjustment Act of 1944 was a pivotal tool that aided in spurring this unprecedented growth. In addition, institutions of higher education evolved to become more similar in terms of curriculum, the training of faculty, and administrative functions. And finally, Generation 10. Geiger proposes that the true importance and meaning of higher education in this final generation is yet to be clearly defined or understood. While a predominant theme may yet be to emerge, several important characteristics do emerge. Enrollments have been largely stagnant, stagnant during this time and federal support of both institutions and institutionalized research has been reduced as well. Federal support for students, however, has seen an increased commitment with the establishment of federal financial aid programs. In addition, students demanded that the education offered to institutions of higher education be more relevant to both their lives and their professional careers. So let's wrap it up. Higher education in the United States was enjoyed, uh, has enjoyed a varied and often tumultuous history. From its beginnings as institutions linked inextricably with religion to the current professional and vocational model of the early 21st century, change has been the mantra. As American society has evolved, the institutions of higher education have also evolved to meet the needs of its student citizenry. Higher education in America has consistently met with those needs, though in some cases with reluctance. It cannot be denied, however, that as our society has evolved, so has higher education. It is always and continued, continues to play a role in, the developing, uh, in developing the culture, civility, and skills required by the students of each generation. Uh, well, if you like this video, please click on the like button. Hope you did. And leave your comments in the comments section below.